Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. We're going to go through another one of these uh, chapters of the story of the Old Testament. And like I, uh, I mention every week, it seems like we're just moving right along. The title of our lesson this week is Wisdom from God. Wisdom from God. There's two different kinds of wisdom. And I guess maybe the worldly folks call theirs wisdom. But there is the wisdom of the world and there is the wisdom of God that comes from God. And if it's included in His Word, it's godly wisdom. If it's not, it ain't. There's a lot of wisdom that are just, it's simply of man. And one of the things that we're going, that we're striving to do this morning is to understand the nature and the message of the Old Testament wisdom. The nature and the message of it. To realize that a deeper knowledge of God can bring a closer relationship with Him, which in turn leads the believer to true wisdom, which only comes from God. And to examine our relationship with God, praying that He will reveal any areas where we need to grow in and practice true godly wisdom and in order to practice it we have to learn it and we have to know it and there's only one way to do that and that's studying his word so that's what we're striving to do this morning let's do as we normally do let's go to the lord this morning and ask him to send his spirit to lead us into truth this morning as we go to him dear heavenly father god we thank you so much for your word lord we just ask like solomon asked you years ago for your wisdom god for your wisdom your guidance and your knowledge Lord, that we would also apply it to our lives. God, that we would be doers of your word and not hearers only. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen and amen. Our key verse this morning is Proverbs 9 and 10. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Now sometimes, as we walk through the Christian life, it's easy to fall into the trap of going through the motions. In such times, it's important to revisit the words of Scripture regarding what it means to truly know God. The wisdom literature of the Old Testament provides some valuable reminders and practical instruction. Today's lesson reminds us that as we experience a fresh, life-changing encounter with God, true wisdom should naturally follow. Should naturally follow. And this, uh, this, that's how you know if it is godly wisdom or if it isn't. If you've had that life-changing encounter with God. Because if you're, if you're living and striving to live by godly wisdom, there's going to be some outward effects. There's going to be some what we call evidence of that. What is wisdom? It depends on who you ask. In today's world, there are many messages in various forms of media that seek to tell you how to make wise decisions. Most of these messages present wisdom framed in a 21st century concept of success and comfort. But true biblical wisdom is rooted in a vibrant relationship with God based on a true knowledge of Him. This knowledge should change the way that we think, act, and live, and change us from the inside out. Job 28 and verses 1 through 11 sets the stage for the lesson by describing the difficulty of mining valuable metals and gems in ancient times. Treasures such as gold, silver, and gemstones were so desirable that men found a way to seek them in the depths of the earth. Verse 4 is especially descriptive in reminding us that human ingenuity was at work even in the days of Scripture. Our lesson compares the value of wisdom with the treasures painstakingly mined from the earth. True godly wisdom cannot be obtained through human means. Now we're going to go over to Job chapter 28 and read verses 12 through 22. Job 28 and 12 through 22 says, But there shall be, but where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. The depth saith, 
It is not in me, and the sea saith, It is not with me. It cannot be gotten for gold, neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. You can't buy it. You can't buy it. Verse 16, It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx, or the sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it, and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. Again, you can't buy it. No mention shall be made of coral or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it, neither shall it be valued with pure gold. Whence then cometh wisdom, and where is the place of understanding? Seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living and kept close from the fowls of the air. And verse 22. Destruction and death say we have heard the fame thereof with our ears. Now many people spend their time seeking wealth. If they can just have their bank accounts at a certain level, they'll feel secure. Others look for positions of power in their jobs or recognition of fame for their accomplishments. Some seek higher degrees believing that more knowledge will bring fulfillment. But God places a high value on wisdom, which is vastly different from wealth, power, fame, or knowledge. True wisdom is worth seeking, and it can come only from God, who is the source of wisdom. Now, in Bible times, great value was placed on wisdom. Even outside of Scripture, documents from Egypt and Mesopotamia extol the virtue of pursuing wisdom, for it was seen as bringing order. Bringing order. And this is mentioned several times in Scripture about true godly wisdom bringing order. I'll tell you what, you look around and take a look at our society, uh, it's no secret that godly wisdom is declining in it because order is declining right along with it. Who would have ever believed we'd see the things that we've saw taking place and the police and the authorities just standing down? You know, even worldly wisdom lets you know better if, you're, if, you're plight, if you think your plight is unfair, if you think your plight is just unbear unbearable, why go burn down the businesses and the buildings in your neighborhood <laughs> that are there to serve you? That's the total opposite of godly wisdom, isn't it? And with the lack of godly wisdom, as the Word says, lack of order. Lack of order. Everything's just in chaos. Without a solid set of, I'm talking about folks, I mean, laws based on godly wisdom based on the Ten Commandments based on the law of God and the moral laws of God and how to treat one another how do we know how to treat one another the laws of God we depart from that we depart from order and right on down the line progressing to departing from sanity which we're bordering today it's, it's you know it's we used to say things well that's insane <laughs> it is insane. And it's because of lack of godly wisdom that it comes. For it was seen, this, this, this godly wisdom, it was seen as bringing order. Job 28 and 12 through 22 provides godly direction to the innate human desire for wisdom. And it's found partly within the area of order and purpose. Order and purpose. When godly wisdom declines, order and purpose declines. In creation, God brought order to the universe. The pursuit of godly wisdom then gives us a proper biblical understanding of order within this world. Many of the Proverbs tell us, tell us how wise living and decision making will bring order to our lives. Will bring order to our lives. How many think that's important? Absolutely it's important. Without it, you have nothing but chaos. Don't know what to expect from others. Don't want to know what to expect from God, even. 
will bring order to our lives. If the one who is wise lives righteously, he or she can expect righteous outcomes. The opposite is true as well. Foolish living leads to sorrow and disaster. How many times have I heard Brother Brankel say, loose living leads to disaster and destruction. Loose living. And what is loose living? It's living according to no godly wisdom whatsoever, just whatever feels good. That's right. That one commandment of the Satanic Bible, I know I've told you before, there is a Satanic Bible. I forget right now, it escapes me, the man who actually wrote it, Lester Crowley or somebody like that. And rather than having ten commandments in any more of their moral code, there's one commandment in the Satanic Bible. And that one commandment is, do what thou wilt. Do what thou wilt. In other words, do what you want to do. Just do it. It's been paraphrased a lot of other ways. Uh, if it feels good, do it. I've heard that one. And uh, unfortunately, people, a lot of people fall for that. And that is part of worldly wisdom. That's part of worldly wisdom. Job 28 reminds us that the source of true wisdom, the order by which all creation operates, cannot be found in this earth. It does not originate with humanity. It wasn't dreamed up or thought up of man. There's no man with such a mind that came up with the standard of true wisdom. True wisdom comes from God. Nor can it be bought at any price. Worldly. What is the difference, you think? Uh, what are some ways that worldly wisdom, this is a question for a discussion, what are the, some ways that worldly wisdom is different from godly wisdom? You think of the main differences between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom? There you go. That's the main difference. That is the main difference. Do what you want to do. Or do what? You know, and it, it's become more and more popular even today. I'm talking about even people in church and even some church sites. There, a lot of times, their, their advice is follow your heart. <laughs> that's it. And we don't know for sure if it's right. So that's really not really a sound statement, is it? <laughs> follow your heart. It sounds good. You know, and it sounds really good. Uh, it says that it's deceitful above all things. It says your heart is deceitful above all things. That's a big one. Worldly, uh, worldly wisdom, and folks, it's everywhere. Uh, there, how many, how many of these self-help conventions are there with these motivational speakers? And you go and these motivational speakers, and they tell you how, and they giving you this worldly wisdom and how to live and how to be happy. They say the things that are important is self-confidence, self-esteem. Self-worth. Remember the old commercial, you're worth it. Whatever it is, you're worth it. Go ahead and buy this product from us <laughs> so we can have your money. You're worth it. That's worldly wisdom. Uh, these motivational speakers and things, and they, to give you this worldly wisdom, but godly wisdom you, uh, you kind of remove that self part because the difference is godly wisdom wisdom uh, takes action inside of God lo God's laws not just to please yourself sensually but to whatever you do is inside God's laws there are perimeters within you know and it reflects him worldly says follow your heart Godly says that the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? So why in the world should you depend on it and follow it? 
if it's deceitful above all things who can know it but these are the differences between godly wisdom and worldly wisdom fearing God is true wisdom let's go over to Job well we need to read verses 23 through 28 we haven't read those still in Job 28 verses 23 through 28 it says God understandeth the way thereof and he knoweth the place thereof for he looketh to the ends of the earth and seeth under the whole heaven to make the weight for the winds and he weigheth the waters by measure when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder then did he see it and declare it and he prepared it yea and searched it out and unto man he said behold the fear of the Lord that is wisdom and to depart from evil is understanding the fear of the Lord that is wisdom and to depart from evil is understanding we might as well go on over to Proverbs Proverbs 2 Proverbs 2 and 1 through 6 says my son if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding yea if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God for the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding it's going over to chapter 9. And verse 10. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. This is knowledge and understanding. The fear of the Lord is one of the most misunderstood concepts in Scripture. But that fear should be defined through our relationship with God. The fact that the creator of the universe loves us and made a way to reconcile us to himself ought to lead us to recognize his holiness compared to our unworthiness. One of the best examples of such fear of the Lord is found in Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8. Upon recognizing God's holiness compared with his own sin, Isaiah was moved to worship and serve God with all his heart. Job 28 verses 21 through 28 contains what is called synonymous parallelism in Hebrew poetry which verse each verse consists of two lines or thoughts that are essentially saying the same thing verses 23 and 24 answer the question raised in verses 21 and 22 only God can see where wisdom dwells further it says emphasize verses 25 through 26 further emphasize that wisdom was present in the very act of creation all of this leads to the conclusion that the fear of the Lord is wisdom now this principle of fearing God is common in the book of Proverbs in chapter 2 verses 1 through 6 we are reminded that God is the sole source of true wisdom then in chapter 9 and 10 which we read says we find the, the familiar statement that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom the idea of fearing the Lord can be challenging to understand the Hebrew noun translated fear can mean terror in the sense that most understand the word. But when coupled with the word God or Lord, it conveys a strong sense of piety and reverence. And when it's talking about the fear of God, it's talking about reverence. Reverence and acknowledging who he is for what he is. As believers, we should have a sense that God is transcendent. He's transcendent. He's wholly other, meaning that He is not like us. He is far above us. And He is sovereign and powerful over us. And when we realize this is when we come closest to realizing the fear of God and why we reverence Him. He's not just our good buddy that gives us everything we want. He's not our glorified bellhop. 
that sits at our beck and call. At times in this modern Christian experience, people are led to believe that, just that, and that they can approach him so casually, too casually. Folks, we are able through Christ in this time to boldly approach the throne of God and make petitions known unto him. But his word talks about that he is high and lifted up and he is far above us and he deserves reverence and the fear that is due him. The Old Testament contains several examples of God's people becoming overwhelmed with self-awareness of sinfulness and uncleanness in the presence of God. If we truly get a handle of who God is and what He is and we come into His presence, there's no way that we're not, our attention is not going to be drawn to how sinful and how deceitful our hearts are and what kind of shape that we are without Him. And when we don't get that, when we haven't come in, the, in, in close enough proximity to His Spirit to realize and to feel this, then we have a lackadaisical approach. We can, we can kind of think that we're coming into His presence and just, you know, just make it a mundane, everyday thing. Believers today, as in Bible times, should sense the awesomeness should sense the awesomeness of who God is. I remember, and thank goodness it has pretty much passed. But I would, I remember the kids, I, Cody knows what I'm going to say because we used to talk about it pretty regular. The kids, and bless their heart, they thought that word, and it got to where it was real popular and they all liked to use that word and they'd go to church camp or something and we'd hear their testimonies and things when they'd come back and everything there was awesome. Awesome. The food was awesome. Our rooms were awesome. The bus we rode there and back was awesome. <laughs> of course, I would try and strive to teach them, no, food's not awesome. Now, you can tell by looking at me, <laughs> I hold it in pretty high regard. <laughs> I'm not going to miss very many meals. I like it pretty well. But God is awesome. God is awesome. Uh... Anything else is not awesome. Believers today should sense this awesomeness of who God is. Both Proverbs 9 and Job 28 speak of the fear of God as including understanding. As we understand who God is through Scripture as well as a daily walk with Him, we learn what it means to live in fear and in reverence of the Lord. In fear and in reverence of Him. How would you describe what it means to fear the Lord? It says to encourage students to refer to scriptures about honoring God and forsaking sin. The, the main things that, that, that we've talked about here when it talks about describing the fear of the Lord, fear, respect, awe. And when you truly get just a little bit of a glimpse, you can't really totally know him. You can't totally see him. As a matter of fact, if you if you want to try to ex, if you want to even come close to trying and, ex, and express the greatness and the glory of God, you better start now. You better start now, and you better do it through eternity. And the Word says that you will never be able to describe how totally awesome and great our God is. But if you believe Him and you believe in Him, you better start now. Do you think the concept of fearing the Lord is downplayed among Christians today? Do you think maybe that the concept of fearing the Lord is downplayed among Christians today? I believe it is too. We have so many. And a lot of times, folks, you know, I, I, I wouldn't put anybody down who's trying to reach people for God. Especially if they're reaching Him I'm talking about in a, in a way that they can come to a realization of who He is and how high and lifted up He is and how we should serve Him and how 
that we, there should be a change if we're truly living according to godly wisdom there will be a change but it almost seems to me a bit too casual at times you know we have our signs welcome home welcome home and come as you are I think you should be welcome home and it should be home and you should but I'm going to tell you something you can approach it a little bit too mundane now this is my this is my thought and 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 from scripture and what I've learned in the word of God I think that fearing the Lord is downplayed enough that it's just a little bit too casual at times today a lot of times we don't realize whose presence we're coming into and we don't realize the way that we should come into his presence if we truly come into his presence how many instances in the word of God have we heard where the ministers could not even stand to minister that the cloud of the glory was so thick in the place where they were at that they couldn't even stand to minister if we truly come into his presence we will be changed we will be changed it won't be you know like the preacher said he was late for Sunday service and he was the one supposed to be preaching when he walked in the pastor that had him he was an evangelist the pastor that had him to speak said what happened you're late and he said well you know he said on the way here he said I had a flat and I went to change the tire on my truck and he said while I was doing it one of the lug nuts rolled out into the highway and he said I walked out he said I was in a hurry and I didn't look like I should have and I walked out in the highway to get that lug nut and I was ran over by a semi <laughs> now if you heard somebody tell that story you know you would think one of two things you would think he's either crazy or he's lying wouldn't you you'd think the man is either crazy or he's lying well if somebody can tell you that they've came into contact with a God that we serve such an awesome God and a mighty God and come through it unchanged because I promise you, you have an encounter with that semi-truck, you're, you're going to be changed. <laughs> you're not going to be as, as you were before that encounter. So that's why if somebody told you that they had come into contact with that semi-truck and they were unchanged, they were normally, there was nothing wrong with them at all. You would think of those two things. They was either crazy, but the same thing holds true for God. If they have a good realization of who God is, and how mighty and how awesome he is and they tell you that they've come into contact with him and they've not been changed same thing you're going to either say they're lying or they're crazy because they can't come into contact with him true relationship and contact with him without being changed without being changed let's go to Proverbs 3 Proverbs chapter 3, we're going to read the first 18 verses. Says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things that thou canst desire not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. 
Her ways are ways of pleasure, pleasantness, excuse me, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. Talking about wisdom. If you're a parent, you've undoubtedly offered advice to your children, even if they were adults. Undoubtedly. <laughs> Can't help it. Your advice, whether or not it was heeded, now that's it, it may not be heeded, but whether or not it was heeded was meant to help your children live happier, more successful lives. As our Heavenly Father, God's instruction to us is always intended to benefit us. It is always intended to benefit us, not for our harm. Proverbs 3 provides a father-to-son form of communication seen throughout wisdom literature, especially in the book of Proverbs. Adherence to parental teaching will lead to long life and peace. Verse 3 instructs the son not to let mercy and truth leave him. The word for mercy here is chesed. The important Hebrew word discussed in lesson 2 that denotes God's covenant love. This word often coupled with the word truth, which indicates that godly wisdom reflects internal character based on love and truth. The familiar words of verses 5 and 6 involve a sense of gaining a relational knowledge of God built on trust, which stands in stark contrast to learning, excuse me, leaning on one's own understanding. Verse 7 elaborates on this by once again reminding us of the call to fear the Lord, which is evidenced by turning from evil. Fearing the Lord is evidenced by turning from evil. If we truly fear God, we're going to turn from evil. If we kind of consider Him a, an equal, and it's nothing really special to come into His presence, we may, possibly, we, we may still live to please ourselves rather than Him. But if we realize who He is, and what he is and we love him it's going to be evidenced by turning from evil such a life is blessed by God and another thing that it will do brings honor to him not ourselves not ourselves but to him Verses 11 and 12 dig deeper into the relational aspect of knowing God as it extols the virtue of accepting His discipline as a sign of His love and concern for His people. It's noteworthy then that these verses are followed by a description of wisdom as valuable and precious, similar to the Job passage considered earlier. As we submit to God's instruction and discipline, we can embrace the truth that His wisdom is truly more beneficial than earthly wisdom or riches. What do you think it means to have a relational knowledge of God? What do you think it means to have a relational knowledge of God? Folks, it's not just a knowledge that somebody else told you about. Some people, that's the only, not, that's the only actual knowledge that they have of God. is just what grandma or grandpa told them. Just what mom and dad told them and left them because they've never actually got in the Word and dug and tried to gain understanding and worked out their own salvation with fear and trembling, as the Word of God says, and had that relational knowledge of God right here. I'm talking about when you know that you know that you're serving the right one. Right. Right. It's a relational knowledge. What are some, some specific ways that godly wisdom can lead to God's blessings? What are some specific ways that godly wisdom can lead to God's blessings? Well, what that godly wisdom is going to do is going to put you in, in position to gain and enjoy these blessings that it's talking about here. If you follow nothing but worldly wisdom, worldly knowledge and you don't acknowledge God in any of his ways you're not going to be in position you're not going to be in the right place at the right time 
to experience God's blessings. You know, it's like Psalms 1. You don't want to be standing in the way of sinners. Well, what it's talking about, they're standing in the way of sinners. You're in position to be reaping that rather than God's blessings. It makes a difference where you are. And godly wisdom leads to godly blessings. It puts you in position to receive them. Matter of fact, let's go read that. It's Psalms 1. Psalms 1, verse 1 through 6. It said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. It won't meet muster. It won't make it. It won't make it. As we grow in our relationship with God and follow His Word, our behavior should change. Much like the psalmist in Psalm 1, Paul contrasted the behavior of those who would produce the works of the flesh with the, those who live by the Spirit. In Galatians 5, those who love God should be changed by the Spirit and produce fruit of the Spirit. Psalms 1 offers another look at how the Bible uses liter literary met methods of, of wisdom literature. Being able to recognize methods such as parallelism and repetition can help us understand the message of Scripture more clearly when we read the Old Testament poetry. Verse 6, for instance, is what some call antithetic parallelism. That is, the second thought is the opposite of the first. And therefore, the two thoughts stand in stark contrast to one another. Verse 3, however, uses parallel thoughts to elaborate on, initial, on the initial statement. A tree that is planted by the water, first thought, yields on the initial statement. A tree that is planted by the water yields its fruit, excuse me, second thought. And it does not wither, third thought. When we read Scripture this way, we're reminded to look at an entire thought as a single message rather than dividing it into two or three distinct messages. We might also notice that Psalms 1 bears some resemblance to the Beatitudes in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Indeed, we, we, some have called the psalm a Beatitude with an explanation. More specifically, it explains what it means for God's people to live out the instruction of His Word and also reaffirms the blessings of doing so. The blessed man constantly meditates on God's law or Torah. This word Torah refers to the first five books of the Old Testament and is usually translated law, but it can also mean instruction or teaching. As a result, we can apply this as reference to the full teaching of the Old Testament. The person who meditates on God's law thereby puts it into practice. is like a strong tree that produces good fruit of righteous living. On the other hand, since God alone is the source of wisdom, those who do not meditate on His Word are classified as the wicked. The righteous person has the wisdom necessary to avoid aligning himself, excuse me, lining himself with the wicked. And in the end, the evidence of one's wisdom or foolishness is found in the fruit of his or her life. That's how we know on which side you're being actually controlled by and living by. By this fruit that's exhibited in your life. Many of us cross paths with the wicked in our, our daily occupations. How do you find proper balance in your relationships with the unsaved 
who may be similar to those described in Psalms 1 and 1. I talked about it a little bit while ago. The ones that standeth in the way of sinners. And we have to reach them. We're in the world, but not of the world. They're in the world and of the world. But we don't want to be standing in the way of sinners because that's going to put us in a position to receive what they do. You know, I've said it so many times, we come into contact with them and we are to witness to them and we are to share the gospel with them. But we don't go where they go and we don't do what they do. And why do we not go where they go and do what they do? How can you reach them? How can you truly reach them if you do that? If they don't notice any difference in you and themselves, how many times have you heard it? I'm not going to church down there. Them people ain't no different than I am. They do the same things I do. There you go. But they do that, don't they? I've always said that one of the main things is, you know, I'm not going to church down there with a bunch of hypocrites. You want to go to hell with them? If you don't get saved and you don't serve God, you're going to go to hell with them. If they're true hypocrites, that's where they're headed. Wouldn't go to church with them, but like Sister Verda said, they'll go to Walmart with them. A bunch of them down there, they'll go and go there. But don't be similar, you know, the unsaved in your relationships with the unsaved. How will living a health how will having a healthy fear of the Lord impact the way that you live out the Christian life? How will having this healthy fear of the Lord impact the way that you live out your Christian life? It'll be evidenced. Just like we talked about, it'll be evidenced by turning from evil. If you have a healthy fear of God and an understanding of His holiness and who He is, and you love Him and you even remotely want to please Him, then this will be evidenced by turning from evil. What do you think it means to delight in the law of the Lord? What does it mean to delight in the law of the Lord? I think it means you'll love it because you know that it's drawing you closer to the one that you love. As many of the prophets and preachers and the teachers and those throughout had described it as honey, as sweet, as something really enjoyable. And it can do that when you know that it draws you closer to God. The goal of true wisdom. Let's go to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. We're going to read verse 11 and 12. It says, Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. For wisdom is a defense, and money is a defense. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. In today's Society concern over money or the lack of it often dominates our lives. While we know that many things are more important than money, most people spend a large portion of their waking hours earning money or spending it. The Bible itself has a great deal to say about wealth, poverty, and the Christian's response to both. As with most things, God's Word calls for balance. Ecclesiastes 7 and verses 11 and 12, which we just read, gives a vivid contrast between wise living and foolish living. From a godly perspective, notice, however, that verse 11 doesn't say that an inheritance is a bad thing in itself. 
Wisdom and inheritance are weighed and both are found to be good. However, wisdom is far better. Both can bring protection or shelter, but wealth does not endure. It will eventually fade away. Proverbs 23 provides a good perspective. Do not wear yourself out to get rich and do not trust your own cleverness. Cast but a glance at riches and they're gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. They can, they can be gone so fast. Especially if we've got them tied up in something like the stock market. How fast can they be gone? They can be gone just like that, can't they? You know, and it seems that if you listen to the worldly wisdom and the way that people, and people get, so many people get, get caught up in it. They'll spend all their health trying to gain wealth. And when they gain wealth, by then their body is wore out and then they end up, before they leave this earth, they end up spending all their wealth trying to get back their health. And that's what they spent to get their wealth. I tell you what, you spend too much of your health trying to gain wealth and it's not really going to do any good. The Word of God says what? It's like storing it in sacks with holes in it. As fast as you're filling the sack up, it's running out. There's there, but there is a balance there that we're talking about, isn't there? In itself, there's nothing wrong with being financially secure. As a matter of fact, the Word of God teaches about it. Doesn't and even you know we've been taught for years. Go to the ant. Go to the ant. What does he do? He saves up. He'll work all summer and save up enough to eat in the winter. I remember the old fable like, what is the grasshopper though? It's not even a fable, it's in the Word of God. That one is, as a matter of fact, about the ant. What happens to the grasshopper? Doesn't save anything up. So this wisdom that we're talking about here is taught in the Bible, but there's a balance there, isn't there? In itself, there's nothing wrong with being financially secure. Indeed, elsewhere, the wisdom literature exhorts people to be wise and careful with finances. Hard times will befall almost everyone at some point in life, and all wealth can be lost. In, later in Ecclesiastes 7, we're reminded when times are good, be happy. And when times are, ba be, are bad, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. Paul said, I've found, he said, I've just come to the place where in whatsoever state I'm in, therefore they're with to be happy. While financial loss will often bring adversity, godly wisdom will endure no matter our earthly circumstances. The wise person recognizes the folly of materialism and he or she lives according to the knowledge that only God can bring real meaning to life. Only God. How can a Christian know the difference between wisely conserving money and foolishly accumulating money because he or she trusts in it for security rather than in God? How can you tell somebody the difference between somebody who just wisely conserves money or someone who just foolishly accumulates it because it's where their trust is at. How much time and part of your life does it consume? Are you so tied up in earning money and laying it up that you have no time for your family? That you know have no time for the Lord? won't even go to his house to worship because no there's there's work to be done and a dollar to be made a lot of people even though they're off of their daily jobs on the weekends they'll be out doing other things to fill that pocket on the Lord's day that's when you know it's out of balance what's the proper Christian understanding of wealth What's the proper Christian understanding of wealth? There you go. It's all his. He just gives you what you can handle to manage for him. 
Some people get too much. But when you realize and know that it's all his anyway, he owns the cattle of, uh, what does it say, a thousand hills. I heard one old preacher say he owns those cattle on a thousand hills and he, own, he owns all them taters under them hills. So if you know who it belongs to and you know that he's taking care of you, you don't have to spend every waking hour trying to, trying to accumulate more. Godly wisdom brings obedience. Ecclesiastes 12. We're going to read verses 9 through 14. It says, And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words or suitable words. That and that was which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of the assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further, by these, my son, be admonished of making many books. There is no need, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. In today's society, concern over money or the lack of it usually is what, what actually drives people every day. Solomon prayed for wisdom and God granted that request. However, we know from Solomon's life that he didn't fully obey the wisdom that God gave him. God has given us his word, which is filled with wisdom for us to obey. The book of Ecclesiastes written by Solomon, likely toward the end of his life, offers a uniquely biblical exploration of the meaning of life. In the final chapter, we find the very statement found in chapter 1 and verse 1. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Throughout its 12 chapters, Ecclesiastes expresses all the ways in which Solomon sought to find pleasure and meaning in his life, and they were all vain. Verses 9 through 14, which we just read, form an epilogue that expresses the true meaning of life expressed beautifully in verse 13. Highlight the wisdom of Solomon. These verses highlight the wisdom of Solomon, including how he conveyed knowledge to God's people under his leadership. Much of this is available to us today in the book of Proverbs. Verse 11 proceeds to use an agricultural metaphor that likens words of wisdom to a goad or a prod in the hand of a shepherd. This points to the guidance and the direction and instruction that comes from wisdom and suggests that without it, a person will wander from the knowledge of the Lord that he or she ought to be following. What was written by the preacher, Solomon, is enough to reach the final conclusion to what Ecclesiastes explores. Human wisdom is not necessary for this conclusion, and our flawed understanding and conjecture can be a distraction. The essential message as to the meaning of life is simple. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. God is the sole source of wisdom. And the wise seek to know God, to follow his instruction, and to keep his commands. Questions. How would you explain the meaning of life to someone who has not heard the gospel? How could you even do it? How could you even begin to explain the meaning of life to someone who hasn't even heard the gospel or the word of God? From what you know of Solomon, what are some ways he sought to find pleasure and meaning in his life? He sought a lot of different ways, didn't he? How many wives and concubines did it start out saying that he had? I've already forgot. 700 wives and 300 concubines. I believe you're right. Much of this modern wisdom, based on self-serving agendas the wisdom that originates from God is found from the beginning of creation 
Old Testament wisdom teaches us that a reverence for God is the beginning of understanding that true wisdom is all about. True godly wisdom is timeless. If we strive to live righteously, then we can expect good outcomes. Godly wisdom gives us the understanding and the ability to, to turn from evil behavior. Do a self-evaluation to determine if your decision-making process is based on what feels right according to cultural influences or whether the process is, grounding, is grounded in your love and your willingness to listen to God. Because, you know, folks, these things that we're talking about, these precepts and these laws of God, they are either a teacher of godly wisdom. If you listen to them and you pay attention to them, they are a teacher of godly wisdom. If you don't pay attention to them, they're still a teacher. They're a teacher of consequences. Because if you don't adhere to that godly wisdom that's laid forth in the Word of God, you will be subject to his con consequences of that. There you go. That's right. Right. That is right. Godly wisdom is, that's why it's important. That's why we should seek it. Its price is far above rubies. We're out of time.